This morning, as Brian mentioned, is going to be a little bit unique. We are continuing in our sermon series on prayer. But this morning, uh, we want there to be opportunities not just to talk about prayer, but to actually pray. The Lord yesterday when I was just praying, looking over this message, just getting ready for this morning, brought to mind a verse of scripture that I actually had to go look up. And it's, uh, I, I want my house to be called a house of prayer. And I had to go look it up because I couldn't remember. Did Jesus say, my house shall be a house of prayer? Or did he say, my house shall be called a house of prayer? Called, 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 called. And I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. I never really caught that before. But God just wants his house to be known, not even as much as a church. Hey, you going to church today? He said, I I want when people are talking about my house, I just want it to be called a house of prayer. I want people to be saying, hey, are you going to that place where people gather to talk to God? So it's good that we're doing this series on prayer. And by the way, there's, there's these cards with a QR code on the back that just kind of give a synopsis of each of the sermons in the series. I encourage you to pick this up on the way out. It has some additional helps and sermon helps and things like that. But, but here's the thing I want you to get this morning. If we are going to have a vibrant relationship with the living God, We're going to have to enter into a dialogue with God and not just a monologue. That makes sense, right? I mean, any any relationship you can think of, how, how healthy and effective is that relationship if one person does all of the talking and the other person never talks? There's just no ongoing intimacy or depth when it's a monologue and not a dialogue. Think about with God, if all you do is you read the word and then you listen to the prompting of the Holy Spirit, that's a good thing, but it's still a monologue if you're not talking back to God. It's not a dialogue, right? Or or how about this? You don't really ever sit with the word of God or meditate on the word, but you're always coming to God and you're telling God what you want and what you need and what you'd ask God to do, but that's still a monologue. See, dialogue breeds intimacy with God. And so here's the thing, one thing that I, I really want to stand out this morning as a takeaway. If, if, you, if you really want to have a relationship with God, if you want to be hearing from God, make certain that God is hearing from you. Now, the minute I say that, I know when it comes to prayer, we're thinking, okay, if God's going to hear from me, I don't want to just hear from God. I want God to hear from me. What am I supposed to say? What are God and I are supposed to talk about? And Paul actually tells us in a verse of scripture, it's one of, not my favorite, but one of my favorite passages in God's word, because I need it. It says, don't be anxious about anything. I'm like, okay, great. So what's the alternative? He says, in everything by prayer and petition, uh, the ESV says supplication, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. So what do we talk to God about? First of all, we come before God with thanksgiving. See, prayer isn't just asking. It is thanksgiving. It is praise. It is worship. Do you see how the text says with thanksgiving? Hearts that are filled with gratitude are more receptive to the voice of God. Do you believe that? Let me say it another way, the negative way. Hearts that are filled with bitterness and anger and unforgiveness are not very receptive to the voice of God. Oh, and let me tell you why I believe that is. Uh, you, you know, in a car for like the 10% of the population that actually still listens to just the radio and, you know, you turn the knob and you tune into a station. When you're driving down the road and you start getting distant, distant, distant from the source, the signal, I mean, all of a sudden, all you hear is what? Starts with an S. Help me out. On the radio. Static, because you're too far away from the source. And listen to me, a thankful heart just opens up the lines of communication with God. But whenever we're bitter and angry and unforgiving and and resentful and greedy, it just kind of brings static into the relationship. So let me say it this way. When you start singing God's praise, you start hearing his voice. But here's the thing. You go, well, what am I supposed to thank God for, worship God for, praise God for. Actually, in verses four and five, they're just as good. I just don't have those verses memorized. But Paul tells us, he says, rejoice. 
And then he goes on to say, why? The Lord is at hand. What do we have to thank God for this morning, praise God for, worship God for this morning? God is here and God is present and God is not silent. I love how it says rejoice. In other words, the fact that God is near is good news. Just because something is near doesn't mean it's necessarily good news. You ever been driving and maybe your wife or your spouse, your husband says, hey, guess who's near in the rear view? It's a police car. And, and they're real near. They're right behind you and their lights are on. Do you rejoice in that moment just because they're near? So just because it's near doesn't necessarily mean it's good. But Paul tells us the nearness of the Lord is cause to rejoice over because God is near. God is present here this morning to bless you and not to curse you, to give to you and not to take from you. God is here to give you grace and salvation and peace and hope and joy. And so he says, rejoice, rejoice, because God is near. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Here's what we're going to do this morning. I'm going to ask you in just a moment to stand and, and, and Judd and the worship team, they're coming back and they're just gonna lead us in prayer. And you know what that prayer is? It's called worship. And we're gonna be worshiping God. Is that dialogue, is that talking to God, yes or no? And we're gonna be praying, we're gonna be worshiping, we're gonna be praising the God who is near and we rejoice over that because his nearness is good news because he is here to bless us and not curse us, to give and not take. So let me ask you to stand right now, would you? And let's worship this God who is near and let's worship him with all of our heart and soul and mind. said, if you want to hear from God, you got to make sure God is hearing from you. We go, okay, well, in this dialogue, what's our part of the conversation? Well, it's coming before him with thanksgiving and just say, God, you are so, so good. But it's also, it's also asking God, right? I mean, the verse that we're looking at in everything by prayer and petition, supplication. Supplication just means asking. Do you realize asking God melts the heart of God? Do you realize that? Have I ever mentioned to you that I'm a grandfather? <laughs> Two granddaughters. Somebody over there said, yes. Okay, well, you're about to get another one. Another one of those stories. Here, listen, uh, six and four. I'm Pop, Kim, my sweet bride is lovey. And I'm telling you, we've never denied a single request. But, but the four-year-old, for some reason, I mean, we give them everything they want. We believe in spoil. We've raised our kids. We've raised them right. So why shouldn't we get to spoil some grandkids, right? Mom and dad can raise them. We're going to spoil them. So if, if Willa... The youngest wants to sweeten the deal. She wants to make double certain that I and Lovey are going to give her what she wants. I'm not Pop. You know what I am? Poppy. Poppy, please. I'm here to confess not a single Poppy request in four years has ever been denied. <laughs> but you know what Jesus said? Here's what I want you to pray. Our Father, Abba, first word that a Hebrew child said, Dada, Papa, Pop, Poppy. I'm telling you, when you come before God and you just cry out, Poppy, 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 it melts the heart of God. I'm not implying he's some old grandfatherly figure that you can butter up and get what you want out of him, but I am telling you, God responds when you come before him and call him dad and present your requests. And requests aren't just for us, right? Requests are, are, are for others as well. So much of the Lord's prayers, us, our, forgive us, our debts, give us us 
our daily bread. Lead us not into temptation. And so asking isn't just about us. It's asking for those who are around us, right? So let me ask you a question. What, ha- what are you asking God for? And maybe a more important question. What have you stopped asking God for? Is it to heal a broken relationship and you've given up on God ever being able to do that? Is it, is it hmm, for God to show you his purpose in your life, his guidance, his direction? Is it for God to, to save a loved one or a friend? Is it for God to show you someone whom he's calling you to disciple? After all, make disciples is given to all believers. Here's the thing. The worship team is just going to sing over you. You're standing and and you're just standing before God. And I'm going to invite you right now to just ask, just spend. We're just singing one song together. And by the way, there's only one song, but the altar is open. You can make a quick trip to the altar and kneel before God. You can kneel right there where you are. But, But as the worship team leads us, I'm just asking you to just spend some time asking God for yourself and others that which you are burdened about and that which you have stopped asking about. Let's ask Papa, Pop, Poppy right now. If you want to hear from God, make sure God is hearing from you. All right, this is going to be a dialogue. What do we say? Man, thanksgiving, praise, worship, Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble. It's a great place to start, right? And then asking, asking God for that which our heart is burdened, asking God on behalf of others and just coming before him, pop, dad, father, and understanding the intimacy of your relationship with God and asking from that vantage point. It melts the heart of God. But but another place is confession. As it turns out, confession is good for the soul. If you, if you believe that, say amen. amen. Confession is good for the soul. And there's a verse of scripture that I memorized in college. I was reflecting on this yesterday and it dawned on me, oh, I probably memorized it in college because I really needed it in college. And, and it's 1 John 1, 9, right? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Notice how it says if, if we confess. Not all people do, you know. Not even all Christians actually confess sin. It's easy, even as a follower of Jesus, even as a member of the Heights or a faithful attender here, to get into kind of a habit of not confessing sin. And, and honestly, uh, hopefully this is not just self-confession and then I'm projecting onto you. I believe the ingredient in prayer that is most noticeably missing is this ingredient of confession. I believe that we tend to come to God and we praise him, God, you're so wonderful. Oh God, I need this and I need this. And and yet just really dealing with our sin. It's easy if we confess. That implies that it's really easy, even as followers of Jesus, to get into a habit of not confessing. And instead, what do we do? We, We tend to hide our sin, don't we? Delete the browser history. What stays in, what happens? Yeah, I blew it, didn't I? But what happens in Vegas? Yeah, thanks a lot for the help there, okay. (laughs) We hide our sin, right? We make sure nobody sees, nobody knows us, nobody knows our name. Or, 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 Or we excuse our sin. It's easy to do as a follower of Jesus, right? Hey, man, I can't help it. The devil made me do it. Hey, it's just who I am. Hey, I couldn't help myself. Or if we don't excuse our sin, then it's easy to start embracing the sin, isn't it? You ever read Romans chapter 1? Though they know God's righteous decree, 
that those who practice such things deserve to die. It's talking about people who just follow this digression, not a progression, but a digression of sin. Uh, first of all, I sin, and then instead of confessing it, I begin to hide it. And then the next step is I begin to excuse it. Devil made me do it. I couldn't help myself. And then I just begin to embrace it. I just begin to own it. Hey, that's who I am. That's the way I roll. If you don't like it, you can go somewhere else. And, and that's what he's talking about here in Romans chapter 1. And he said, though they know the God's righteous decree. They know those who practice that deserves to die. As it turns out, the Holy Spirit actually convicts of sin, judgment, and righteousness. And so they know their sin, but they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Give approval. It means that we begin to applaud. We applaud our sin. Hey, that's who I am, and I'm proud of who I am. And then we applaud others who join us in that sin because sin always loves company, and that is the digression of sin. And here's the problem with that. Sin cuts off our connection with God, our fellowship with God. But guess what opens up the lines of communication with God again? Starts with a C. Help me out. Say it one more time. Confession. Isn't that amazing? Confession really is good for the soul. Think about David and Bathsheba, right? I mean, it's a sordid tale of lust and adultery and hiding sin and trying to be deceptive, and it ultimately ends up in murder. And then what happens? Nathan the prophet comes, and Nathan the prophet says to David, thou art the man. And this man who had hidden his sin, what did he do next? And the fact is, the Bible Bible says he confessed his sin. You want to hear some professional level grade, professional grade confession? Read Psalm chapter 139. Search my heart, O oh God, and know my heart. Search me. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there's any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. See, confession requires repentance. Without con repentance, confession is just bragging. You get that, right? Yeah, I did it. Without genuine repentance, confession is just bragging about our sin. Confession is admitting our sin and then turning away from the sin. Confession is admitting, yes, God, what I did is sinful. And now, God, I am praying, lead me not into that temptation anymore. Lord, I'm praying, deliver me from that evil. God, you've convicted me, and I don't want to live that way any longer. See, David hid his sin, but David did not excuse his sin. He did not embrace his sin, and he did not applaud his sin. Can you imagine David, this man of God, if Nathan, the prophet, came to him and said, thou art the man. Can you imagine him just excusing his sin? Hey, what can I say, Nate? The devil made me do it. Can you imagine David, this man after God's own heart, saying, hey, Nathan, I embrace what I did. It's just the way I roll. I'm a ladies' man. What can I say? Can you imagine? See, if David had excused his sin or embraced his sin, God would have never said of David, I have found in David the son of Jesse a man after my own heart who will do all my will. Confession is a missing ingredient in our walk with Jesus. And so here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. The worship team is gonna come up. The worship team is going to sing over you. I'm gonna ask you to remain seated. I'm gonna ask you to just bow your head and I'm gonna ask you to just spend some time confessing. And listen, we're gonna put Psalm 139 up on the screen and, and I want you to just meditate on that verse. And then as you meditate on that verse and God brings to mind sin in your life, I'm going to ask you right now, right now, don't hide it. Don't excuse it. Don't embrace it. Don't applaud it. Instead, just come clean before God and confess it and say, God, will you lead me not into the, that temptation? God, will you deliver me from that evil? So right now with your heads bowed, would you just begin a season of confession? Psalm 139 will be on the screen. Meditate on that psalm 
and let the Holy Spirit bring you to a place of conviction and confession. Amen. Look up here, church. If we confess our sins, He is. Does it say He might? Depending on how He feels today. He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do you realize you are forgiven? Do you realize God forgives all that we confess? See, some of you right now, you just, you just came clean before God. You just poured out a bunch of stuff. And I'm telling you, your sin is washed in the blood of Jesus. God's grace is amazing grace. Grace that is greater than all of our, say it with me, what? You're forgiven. You know what we're gonna do now? We're gonna celebrate. Because that's a part of dialoguing with God, right? At some point, we just stand up and we say, yeah, God, God, you're amazing. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiveness. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for eternal life. Thank you for loving me in spite of my sin. I love you, Jesus. Amen. So we're going to stand now. Stand with me and we're going to sing. And we're going to sing like people who have been forgiven and people who are loved by God. Let's sing.